chorus several years ago one night sitting at my piano at home you, you, do you, have a, you have a favorite spot in your home you probably do one of my favorite spots is on the not only sitting on the bench but just kneeling at, at the piano bench and uh, I was sitting there one night and it was probably two in the morning or so and all of a sudden the, the, God just began to give me just sitting there some words and, and it's a little chorus and Greg and I, we did it here Sunday night, and he had mentioned about maybe a singing it here, and we've done it a couple of times. Um, but the words go like this, descend holy fire on me. Descend holy fire on me. Oh, cleanse me, yes, purge me. Inflame my soul. Descend holy fire on me. Ascend. Now, the believer of the Spirit lives within us, obviously. And so, uh, you know, it's kind of like sometimes when someone's giving the details of a picture, and it's a picture of a farm, and there's a barn, and there's a house, and, and there's horses and cows. And, and some people have a way, if you say, wow, look at that wraparound porch, they come back with, oh, but there's a barn, but there's a truck, but there's cows. but there. So please, you know, descend. And then ascend, holy fire, from me, a fragrance so pure for thy glory. Ascend, holy fire, from me. Please send, holy fire, through me. Please send, holy fire, through me. To a world that's lost in the darkness of sin, please send, holy fire, through me. Amen. Uh, it, it, here's how it goes, and, and follow along with me a little bit if you can. So. Uh, descend, holy fire, on me. Descend, holy fire, on me. Oh, cleanse me, yes, purge me, inflame my soul. Descend, holy fire, on me. Ascend, holy fire, from me. Ascend, holy fire, from me. A fragrance so pure for thy glory ascend holy fire from me please send holy fire through me please send holy fire through me to a world that's lost in the darkness of sin please send holy fire through me we sing it with me descend Holy fire on me, descend, 
holy fire on me. Oh, cleanse me, yes, purge me, inflame my soul. Descend, oh, holy fire on me. You know, fire falls on sacrifice. And ascend, holy fire from me. Ascend, holy fire from me. A fragrance so pure for thy glory ascend holy fire from me please send holy fire through me please send holy fire through me To a world that's lost in the darkness of sin. Oh, please sit. Oh, please sit. Oh, God, please sit through us. You holy fire. <laughs> Through me. <laughs> and like a wind, Lord. Blow upon me like a fire Lord burn within me like a river Lord flow through me I pray and by your spirit Lord Come glorify thy name Like a wind, Lord, blow upon me Like a fire, Lord, burn within me Like a river, Lord, flow through me I pray and by your spirit Lord come glorify thy name like a wind Lord Blow upon me Like a fire, Lord Burn within me Like a river, Lord Flow through me, I pray and by your Spirit, Lord, come glorify thy name. By your Spirit, Lord, by your Spirit, Lord, 
Oh, by your Spirit, Lord. Come, glorify your name. We're glad to have with us today Randy Jones from uh, Texas. What are you, Texas, Randy? Dallas. Texas. Dallas, Texas. I'm from the New Jerusalem, Dallas, Texas. And uh, we are looking forward to hear what God wants to share with him, uh, with us through him. And I think we'll just take a moment to pray for you and then give you the time however the Lord leads. Father God in heaven, we thank you for one more meeting, Lord, this side of eternity. Thank you for everyone gathered in here this morning, and we commit this time to you in the name of Jesus. We commit this dear brother and friend in the name of Jesus to you, and we ask you to fill him, to flow through him, and to use him. Speak what you want to to us through him and we pray lord that he would say all that you've given him to say and nothing that you haven't just use him for your glory we commit this time to you in jesus name again father we praise your name from the rising of the sun to the setting down the same the name of the lord is to be praised and father we are very grateful that you have been meeting with us these last two days and we have no reason to believe that it would be different today to come in, in simplicity, no formality, just to come and meet together as brothers and sisters in Christ to hear what God would say to us if we would take time to pray and to seek your face and to listen to what you have to say to us from your servants and from the word. Now, Father, I just met Randy and... Uh, our acquaintance has been very short, but being in Christ, we are brothers in the Lord. And I ask, uh, agreeing also with Brother Merle, that the Spirit of God would just come upon our brother here and you would anoint him afresh and that he would bring to us a message from the presence of God. Thank you now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay. Do they have wired? They don't have wired. Okay. Thank you, brothers 
It's good to be here in this beautiful church. We appreciate the pastor and his church letting the Revival Conference use the facilities. Um, good to see Greg Gordon again and uh, enjoy fellowshipping with him. I uh, am not a Christian missionary. I'm a missionary from Texas going around telling everybody about the promised land. Uh, my daughter-in-law is from Oklahoma, so I always give her a hard time. And uh, it's good to be back in Texas parking lot. It's really sweet. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Start a fight. Um, it is good to be here. Beautiful country, uh, beautiful place. It's in the middle of nowhere. I thought I was never going to get here. Uh, I uh, came in late. I had a uh, a meeting last night uh, and couldn't get away. It was something important, and. I was on my way here, and Greg told me where to go, and I thought about stopping on the way, but I wasn't too tired, so I just kept coming, and he gave me a phone number of a brother to call who could show me my room. Well, I didn't get here till late, so I didn't want to wake him up, so instead I went through the, the building out back and woke everybody up, and if, <laughs> if I opened the door and woke you up, that might have been the Lord, it might have been me. I don't know which one, but uh, anyway, sorry about that. I am uh, privileged to be here. It's always a privilege to talk about Jesus. I just want to talk a little bit. Uh, I want to talk about the cross today. The Bible doesn't say the preaching of the Bible is the power of God unto salvation. It doesn't say the preaching of the law is the power of God unto salvation. It says the preaching of the cross is the power of God unto salvation. I believe in using the law. The law brings conviction of sin. It brings a knowledge of Christ. But if you just use the law to witness and uh, try to win the lost, all you do is get them convicted. But the cross gets them saved. And what Jesus did on the cross, you know, it's a cliche today just to say Jesus died for you. Everybody knows that, they'll tell you that, but they don't really know it. Christians don't know it like they should. I believe with all my heart that the last move of God, I, first of all, I believe the Lord's coming soon. And second of all, I believe that we're running out of time. The last move of God, I believe with all my heart, is going to be a Jesus movement, not a people movement, not a denominational movement, not a church movement, not an American movement, a Jesus movement. If you've been reading the news and seeing what's going on in the world right now, and if that doesn't wake you up a little bit, I, you know how God gets your attention? He smites your 401k. And then he's got your attention. I, uh, just, I'm, uh, I do live in Dallas, Texas now. I'm originally from Tyler, Texas. Uh, the rose capital of the world, and uh, it's a beautiful place, and I have been a pastor. I preached my first sermon when I was almost 13. When I was 12, my parents lost their minds and left Texas, and uh, I moved up north and moved to Louisville, Kentucky area, and when we crossed the Ohio River, I was terrified. That's a mile wide. The biggest river I'd ever seen was the Trinity River. It's about 30 feet wide. In Texas, what they call rivers, every other state calls a creek. And I crossed the Ohio River Bridge, holding on for dear life, terrified. And we lived in that area for many years. And we went to a church there in southern Indiana. And I had been called to preach when I got saved at home at eight years old. And I made the mistake of telling, this. they had an old man there, he was six foot four. His name was Leroy Beatty. And the first time I met him, he looked at me and said, Randy, I've got a Baptist brain, a Pentecostal heart, Jehovah's Witness feet. Now that's a Christian. And I made the mistake of telling him at, at 12 that I was called to preach. From that day on, he was relentless. And, and you're going to have to overlook me and forgive me because I started out preaching on the street corners of Louisville, Kentucky, and being harassed, slapped, uh, chased, had a razor put to my throat one time. 
And just that was how it was normal for me is just uh, being heckled, being yelled at. And you learn to really preach then. In church, everybody just goes to sleep. That's even worse. I'd rather you heckle me. And I'll tell you this, if you don't say amen every once in a while, I may preach till 6 p.m. Because if I think you're asleep, I'll never give up. I'll never quit. And, uh, you know, preaching is the art of talking in other people's sleep. So I'll keep preaching and <laughs> you keep sleeping. One time I was preaching in Tyler, Texas, my hometown, and I got up to preach on Sunday morning. They'd just given me the service, and there was a man on the front row right here, sound asleep, the head deacon, already asleep during the worship. You heard about the church that somebody died during the worship, and they called the paramedics. And they had to examine 21 people before they found the right one. Well, the worship had killed this guy. And I got up, and he was asleep. So I picked up a hymnal and threw it real hard and hit the pew, boom, right next to him. He woke up. He thought the rapture was taking place, and he'd been left behind. But he knew what I was doing. And he watched me like a hawk the rest of the service. Uh, one brother, one man got introduced and he said, I'm not the best speaker in the world, but I'm like the cross-eyed discus thrower. I keep the crowd alert. So I'm going to try to do that. Um, so anyway, we went to this church. I told this old man I was called to preach. I heard he was a street preacher. Later on, I found out he had the whole Bible memorized by heart, King James Version. That's the only man I've ever met in my life that had the whole Bible memorized, even the begats. And he was, to this day, he went to be with the Lord in the 90s. But to this day, he's the most Christ-like man I've ever known in my life. And he made an impact on my life. His boldness, his courage, his joy. Most Christians look like they've just been sucking on lemons in the parking lot right before they come into the church. One side singing, will there be any stars in my crown? And the other side is singing, no, not one. In the middle section singing, and that will be heaven for me. And as Christians, I'm not shocked that sinners don't want what we've got because they already have depression and discouragement and fear. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. He meant for us to enjoy Him. It's serious, but it's fun. There's nothing greater than walking with Jesus Christ. There's nothing greater than the power of the cross that keeps working in your life. So I told this old man I was called to preach. He kept bugging me and bugging me and bugging me. Every Sunday morning, he'd say, Randy. He called me Shouting Randy, which was sarcasm. And he'd say, Shouting Randy, how you doing? I've got a pulpit saved for you, an empty pulpit. I said, really? Because I had in mind, as a preacher, you would have a brick church with a Cadillac and no people in the church, just a brick church. That'd be the perfect church, wouldn't it? And uh, just a good salary and a big parsonage and life insurance. That's what's my idea of preaching, not on the street corner. But he kept on. I got an empty pulpit at 4th and Chestnut, downtown Louisville, Kentucky. Fi I, finally, I, you know, I, on Sunday afternoon, I either wanted to watch the Cowboys, if they were on, take a nap, or play football myself. I'm 12, almost 13, and he kept bugging me. And bu every Sunday, I'd hide. I tried to go out different exits. He supernaturally knew where I was. And he would say, I've got an empty pulpit for you, downtown 4th and Chestnut. And I finally said, Brother Beatty, leave me alone. He said, I can't, brother. The Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he buggeth. That was his paraphrase of provoke one another to love and good works. So finally, he wore me down. I said, I can't go down there. My friends in junior high will see me. So, but finally I went, and when I got there at 4th and Chestnut, I got a ride with someone. It was worse than I thought. There was a big group of prostitutes, obviously dressed up as prostitutes. That was close to Fort Knox, and all the soldiers would come into Louisville on the 4th, uh, 1st and 15th weekends. And there was a big group of prostitutes and this little weird, crazy guy. There's always somebody like that. He actually was crazy. And he was pointing at those women, that when I walked up on the street corner, pointing at them going, prostitutes will not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, they obviously got mad because he was right in their face pointing at them and screaming at them. And so they started beating him with their purse. Just as I walked up, this little guy's running around screaming at them, and they're beating him with their purse, about five women. That's as bad as it gets. 
But brother, I started to turn around and go back. Brother Beatty spotted me and he said, hey, brother Randy, come on over here. So I couldn't get away. I hid behind a post at J.C. Penney's and stuck a track out, hoping it would stick on someone. Because I was terrified that somebody was from school would see me with these crazy people. Well, Brother Beatty sang and played the guitar, and if anybody ever stayed after that, it was a miracle, because he was terrible. I loaned him my guitar one time, and he just ripped it to pieces with a pick. It was a really sweet, nice acoustic guitar, and he ruined it. But it was anointed ruin. As we, he was singing, I saw an older man squatting down, leaning against the wall a few feet over up the street. And Brother Beatty said, go talk to that man. Now, you've got to remember, I've been in church since I was eight. I'm almost 13 now. I had no idea. No one had ever taught me in church how to talk to anyone about Jesus. So I went over and squatted down next to the man, and I just said, and he had tears running down his face. Brother Beatty was singing something like um, uh, In the Sweet By and By or something like that. I said, how you doing? He said, fine. My mom used to sing that song. I said, would you like to get saved? And he said, Yeah. So I patted him on the back and said, God bless you, and walked off. I had no idea how to lead him to the Lord. No one had ever taught me in church. So I walked back to Brother Beatty, and I, he said, well, what did he say? And I said, he wants to get saved. And he said, did you pray with him? I said, I don't know how to do that. So he said, come here, and I'll show you. The first thing I learned from him is this thing is better caught than taught. And he took me over there and, and led that man to the Lord. I've seen him lead whole groups of soldiers to the Lord, groups of children, because he was always smiling, always happy. See, when he was 19, he went downtown Louisville, Kentucky to see a movie. And that was back way back when they had streetcars. And an old plumber, who wasn't a pastor, just a plumber, was preaching on the street corner. And he said, young man, come here. He said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to see a, a movie. He said, I got something better than that. And he led into the Lord right there on the street corner. You don't have to be in church to get saved. Zacchaeus got saved either in the air or in the tree or before he hit the ground. He was saved when he hit the ground. And Brother Beatty, this plumber, led him to the Lord. And he said, now I want you to come with me. I want you to meet some Christian young people. And they got on the streetcar. As soon as they got on the streetcar, it had about 80 people on it. The plumbing, the plumber preacher stood up and said, can I have your attention? Everyone's attention. This man here just got saved and he wants to tell you about it. He had been saved 10 minutes. And he had to get up and testify about his salvation to about 80 people he didn't know. He almost had a heart attack. Well, they got off the streetcar and walked into a gas station. And there was a group of boys, had cigarettes rolled up in their t-shirt, drinking beer, cussing. I don't know what, just acting bad. And this plumber walked in there and said, anybody ever tell you boys about Jesus? They said, no, sir. And he said, this man here just got saved and he wants to tell you about Jesus. Now, he'd been saved 20 minutes by then. And he became, to this day, I, one of my good friends is Ray Comfort, Ray, uh, in Living Waters and uh, Way of the Master. And he's a great soul winner. He got us almost kicked out of Luby's. Uh, I've preached with him in California, but Brother Leroy Beatty, I've never seen anyone like him, so much like Jesus. I went back the next Sunday. I thought, well, this isn't too bad. And as Brother Beatty was preaching, he had a powerful voice. He's preaching on the street corner there. Two boys in a 65 blue convertible Mustang stopped at the red light right there at 4th and Chestnut. And they were revving their engine, honking their horn, trying to drown him out. And one of them yelled, hey, old man, are you Moses? He said, no, son, I'm Saul. My father sent me out to look for two asses, and I just found them. <laughs> and I thought, this isn't too bad. I might could be a street preacher. I like insulting people. Now, he was doing it with joy. And you know what? They got out and talked to him. And from that point on, I was a co-youth pastor at 16. 
uh, I've been a full-time evangelist, revivalist twice in my life. I've preached in hundreds of churches. I've preached so many revivals, camp meetings, retreats, services, youth retreats, youth rallies, banquets, luncheons, pastors conferences, pastors luncheons, that I can't keep track of them all. But along the way, I started realizing I don't see the fruit in Christians, my life and everyone else's life that I want to see. And I went to Christ for the Nations. It's an a non-denominational Bible school in Dallas, Texas. They've taught thousands of students and sent them out all over the world. Number one worship school in the world. A lot of songs you sing were written there by students. And I was a full-time core professor and a dean. And over all their outreach and evangelism in that area for six years. And it was my privilege to preach and teach revivalism for five summers to students from India, Japan, China, literally Timbuktu, Papua New Guinea, from all over, even Canada, all over the world. I got to preach and teach thousands of students about the cross. And that was the core. I taught evangelism. I was the evangelism professor and evangelism director. And I taught revivalism. And it was my privilege to teach them about the cross. And I'm an experienced, seasoned minister. I've pastored, youth pastor, singles pastor, janitor. You know, you're a real pastor when you go around after church flushing the toilets. But only the last few years have I seen what it's really about. It's about Jesus Christ and Him crucified. It's not about denominations. There won't be any in heaven. There's people who would kill you over their denomination. They're faithful to a building. They're faithful to a TV preacher. But God's going to get our attention. And right now, He's judging the church. It's not America. It's not the world. Judgment begins at the house of God. And we better pay attention and start praying and pray for revival. But not just any revival. Francis Schaeffer said, uh, Reformation is a return to sound doctrine. Charles Finney said, Revival is practicing sound doctrine. It doesn't matter what you know. It's what you live. If I could live what I know, I'd be greater than Paul. But I, I can't live what I know. That's the breakdown. And it takes the power of God, the Word of God, the Holy Spirit. But more than, any, than anything else, I think it takes a single heart. A single heart. A utter, an utterness, if I could put it that way. Totally consecrated. Totally dedicated. I believe right now, if the church really made Jesus their Lord, we would turn the world upside down. Jesus is our part-time Lord on the weekends on Sunday morning. But the Bible says He's Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and He owns you, lock, stock, and barrel. All your money, all your kids, your house, Jesus Christ died for you on the cross and bought you. And if the church would start preaching the cross again instead of money and success and miracle, I believe in miracles. I believe God blesses His people. I, the, the righteous have never been forsaken or their seed begging for bread. But that's not the gospel. The gospel is, it's not even a doctrine. It's a person, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the church quit preaching the gospel and started preaching money and prosperity and success, then we see what the result is. God said, okay, I'll take away your money and your success. And I'll take away your place among the nations. I just went to a Memorial Day. We spent Memorial Day in uh, Austin, Texas. You'd have to be a Texan to understand the Alamo. Stand in front of it and cry. <laughs> and there was a big rally there for Texas independence. To succeed from the Union. Quit paying federal taxes. Sounded good to me. Too bad we don't have enough. If we had enough army, I think we could do it. And they had a big sign that said, once again, 
the Republic of Texas will raise its proud head among the nations of the world. Well, guess what? God is, is humbling our proud head. And he has shut up the heavens. And there's no rain. That rains the Holy Spirit. But he said, if my people... God said, when I shut up the heavens and there's no rain, when the power and the, the authenticity of the gospel isn't there and God has shut the heavens up, then he said, if my people, which are called by my name, and by the way, all the cultural Christians are getting off the ark, all the ones who just said they were Christians and thank God for it. All the ones who said they were Christians for some kind of networking, sales, uh, looking good position. Now there's a stigma attached to it and they're fleeing the ark. Thank God. The Bible says only a remnant's going to be saved. God never said he was going to. His will is that everyone would be saved. But he never said they were all going to be saved. Because God's will is done through our prayers. We pray it to pass. In just a minute, I want to focus on the cross, but I love quotations. Charles Spurgeon said, he who seldom quotes is seldom quoted. And Charles Spurgeon has some of my all-time favorite quotations. What a preacher. And my number one all-time favorite quotation is Charles Spurgeon. You know what he said? Preaching that leaves out the cross is the laughing stock of hell. That's good. Another thing he said is, some of you have enough dust on your Bibles to write damnation in it. That's a good quote. And another one he said was, whenever I preach, I read my text and then make a beeline for the cross. No wonder he was a great preacher. And he preached on Jesus like few people that have ever lived. I want you to stand with me for a minute. For just a little while... I want to talk about the cross. And the cross, I'm not talking about a piece of wood. I'm talking about Jesus. The power of his death, his suffering, and his sacrifice. The piece of wood was where it happened. But it's Jesus that made the cross important. You could put up a million wooden crosses. But Jesus, the son of the living God, hanging on that cross... Jesus was fully human and fully God. In the early days, the church battled with the teaching everyone that Jesus was really God. Now we battle with everyone believing he was a real man. But he was a real man, just like you and I. He felt pain like we do. He got tired. He got hungry. And the greatest act in time and space and eternity... It's when the Son of God hung outside of Jerusalem on an old rugged cross, a fountain of blood from head to toe. And by the way, I'm one preacher that's still preaching the blood of Jesus. That's the one thing the devil fears, is the power. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb. The modern churches are taking those hymnals, those hymns out of their hymnals about the blood. And I've preached on the cross all over the world, literally different uh, countries, not every country, but different countries, America. All o I preached all over Oklahoma, Texas, every, everywhere I could go. And I preached on the blood and the cross. And one lady came up after church and said, you, you made it too gory, too bloody. And I said, sister, the half hasn't been told. That's the worst suffering that's ever happened in time and eternity. It was on that hill outside of Jerusalem. And Jesus' physical suffering was the least of his suffering. He suffered in his soul. God saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. And I hope that when you leave today, just at least one thing I say will get you more excited about what Jesus did for you and the whole world on the cross. And he died for everyone. Not everyone's going to receive it. But he whosoever will may come. Brother Beatty had a Baptist background. I said, Brother Beatty, do you believe in uh, once saved, always saved? He said, I believe in it for me. I believe in it for me. The Bible says only those who endure to the end will be saved. 
And I'm not trying to start a controversy. I'm just saying if you ain't living it, you ain't real. And ain't is a Texas word, I think. You got to live it to be saved. Saving faith. It'll change your lifestyle. You'll lose part of your vocabulary when you get saved. You'll lose part of your mind when you get saved. And we had more people really saved. Ray Comfort told me one time, Randy, it's not the Christians that wear the pastor out. It's the false converts that wear the pastor out. And that's the truth. So I want you to pray with me that the Lord will show you something about the cross. Because the cross isn't just in time and space. It was born in eternity past in the heart of God. When Jesus, the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. When Jesus laid his will down. And the Father's will stood up. An eternal cross was born in the very being of God. And it's that cross that I'm talking about. Jesus was born crucified. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for everyone here. Open up their hearts, Lord. Lord, plow up the fallow grounds of our heart. Lord, I just pray that the word would find good ground. The word of the cross, find good ground. Lord, find... A uh, soil that's good and honest and take root downward and bear fruit upward. Uh, cover us all and put us under the protection and cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. Push back the powers of darkness, Lord. Cleanse the atmosphere. Cleanse the heavenlies. Lord, cut through our flesh. Cut through the enemy. And give us a new revelation of the mighty, awful, suffering Lamb of God hanging on Calvary's cross. In Jesus' name, everyone said. Before you sit down... Turn to someone and tell them, I've, I've never seen anybody look like you in my whole life. Then you may be seated. <laughs> Thank you. See, that's what I risked coming up. If you'll open your Bibles quickly to John chapter 1. I love being a Christian. I have more fun by accident than sinners do on purpose. When I lead outreaches, I led five outreaches to Mardi Gras. Took thousands of students. Hundreds, maybe thousands. And the main principle... Well, first, be normal. Number two, be happy and excited. And number three, come in the spirit of the Lamb of God. We're not there to scream at people. We're there to tell them about Jesus and not compromise, but come in the spirit of the Lamb of God. You'd be amazing. You'd be amazed how well that worked. Everybody else was walking down the streets with signs that said, God hates sinners. And no one listened to them. We were telling them there were sinners and they were going to go to hell, but we did it with love. And we did it in the, spirit, the opposite spirit of the world, the spirit of the Lamb of God. And the, the Lamb of God is the greatest type in the Bible. And I don't know why we don't preach on it more. The, the type of the Word of God is the Lamb of God. From Genesis to Revelation, all the way through the Bible, this is the type of and this is the biggest type in the Word of God. This is the biggest principle. It's Jesus' nature is a lamb. The little animal that you see out in the pasture that's fuzzy and woolly and, and, and eating the grass and really nice and gentle, that's not a lamb. That's a picture God painted of the lamb that's seated at his right hand in heaven. And my dad got tired of mowing his back pasture one time, so he bought some sheep. And they were behind my house, too, in the country in New Albany, Indiana. And one of the sheep had a sheep. And by the way, shepherds don't have sheep. Sheep have sheep. And I walked out, and there's this tiny, and the Greek word in Revelation is lambkin. A tiny, baby, newborn lamb. I think it's 17 or 21 times I get confused. Somebody said 21, and it confused me. All the way through, the, it's always a lambkin, a tiny baby newborn lamb. That's Jesus. And this little tiny baby lamb was so cute. It was fresh, just came out. And I walked up to pet it. I was going to touch it and pet it. And the mother was just looking at me. She didn't care. She knew me. 
And when I reached out to pet it, it went, ah! It bit my hand almost off. No, it, it didn't. It was a lamb, not a Christian. I mean, <laughs> Martin Luther said Christians don't tell lies, they sing them. No, no it didn't do anything. It didn't have any fangs. It didn't have any claws. It was just born. It couldn't even stand up. That's the picture of God's son in the book of Revelation. And that lamb went back to Abel. I, my personal opinion, I'm personally convinced that God killed lambs and covered them with those bloody skins. Because we know he covered them with skins. We know that Abel offered the firstling of the flock. And something happened when he put it on the altar. My opinion is that fire came down and consumed it. Because Cain saw it and made him mad. That lamb and his blood is the message of the Word of God. It's the only hope of the universe. And John the Baptist, who was a great prophet, Jesus said he was the greatest prophet. Do you know why? If he ever worked a miracle, it's not recorded. But you know why he was the greatest prophet? Because his privilege, his ministry, his calling. And by the way, he, he destroys every theological camp in the world. He was <laughs> filled with the Holy Ghost before he was born. That destroys every theological camp I've ever heard of. He was... I, God. The Bible says God doesn't give His Spirit to the wicked. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb and was more on fire than most of us. He leaped for joy because he heard the Lamb's voice before he was born. And he came from the womb, the Bible said, filled with the Holy Ghost. And that, I don't understand that, but I believe it with all my heart. God can do anything he wants to do. I'm sorry to inform you. And that's what he did. And he went out in the wilderness wearing a, a, a leather garment and eating bugs. <laughs> Modern commentators try to say there were leaves off the locust tree. <laughs> That's such baloney. The Greeks had a word for it, baloney. <laughs> Bugs and wild honey. And he was rough around the edges. He never read how to win friends and influence people. And he came out of the wilderness baptizing, preaching repentance. The first word of the gospel is repent. Reform. Turn around. Start thinking about sin like God thinks of it. That's repentance. Boy, he was preaching repentance, and even the Pharisees, even the Pharisees were coming down. Folks, that's a miracle. And they wanted to be baptized. And, and if it had been us, we'd go, sweet, the Pharisees are coming. The ones with money. The ones with the big robes. I have a book called The Pharisees' Guide to Total Holiness. <laughs> John the Baptist wasn't like us. He looked at them and said, You brood of vipers! What a man of God! <laughs> he didn't care about the offering. I saw this cartoon of this huge church and the pastor was preaching on Sunday morning only one couple on the back row. And he said, As you may recall, I said some things last Sunday that needed to be said. <laughs> John the Baptist preached the truth. What could God do with a whole generation of John the Baptist that would stand up and preach the cross again and introduce the world again to the Lamb of God? What could God do with that? He could turn the world upside down. And John the Baptist was martyred at about 30 two years old. One thing we forget reading the Bible, these were young men in their 20s and 30s. Paul was only saved about 30 years before he was beheaded. These young men were following a young man named Jesus Christ. And John the Baptist's privilege was to introduce the world for the first time in time and space to the Lamb of God. You know what's exciting to me? We can have that same ministry. 
We're all called to that same ministry. Jesus said there's never been a prophet born greater, born of woman greater than John the Baptist, but the least in the kingdom of God is greater than him. We can do the same thing. In fact, that is our calling. Jesus said, Behold, I send the Holy Spirit upon you, and you shall receive power from on high, and you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. It's called the great hint, right? The great suggestion. That's the great commandment. And when we start thinking about trying to win souls and witness, we think, Oh, I don't know all the law. Just tell them about Jesus. Tell them how you met him, how he delivered you from whatever, from yourself, from sin, from alcohol, whatever it is. And tell them about the power of the cross. People are interested in that. They're not interested in religion. Religion has sent more people to hell than Hugh Hefner and Jack Daniels. Hell so full of church members right now, it's packed out. There's most right reverends in hell. You can walk down every aisle, sign every card, shake every preacher's hand, walk down the aisle on Sunday morning and go straight to hell. Only a vital living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and your sins under the blood will get you into heaven. And that's daily, by the way. You can be baptized in every stream, every creek, every river, every pond, till every catfish knows you by your first name and go straight to hell. There's, most, there's, there's doctors of divinity in hell. Have so many degrees behind their name, you can call them Fahrenheit. Because only the blood of Jesus can keep you out of hell. And John the Baptist shook up Israel. Turned them upside down. One man. He said, what can one man, what can one pastor, if you're a pastor, we have any pastors here? A couple, a few. If you're a pastor, the one thing the devil's afraid of, if you'll start preaching Jesus in the cross. And at first, people are going to want something else. Give us some gravy, some frosting. We don't want that meat. We think church is like lubies. We just go through and pick out what we like. I don't know if y'all have lubies here. It's a cafeteria. You go through and pick out what you like. Pecan pie, chicken fried steak with white cream gravy, gravy Texas toast, fried okra. Some of you getting hungry, rebuke that. Brother Beatty used to say, some of, some of us believe the Bible's inspired in spots, and we're the ones inspired to spot the spots that are inspired. It's all the Word of God. It's all the Word of God. And John the Baptist, Jesus said, he's the greatest ministry, and, and, and here, here's the crux of who Jesus is. Here is the introduction in verse 29. The next day when... The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man, who's, I'm in John 1.30 uh, now, who's preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him. This is his cousin. But he didn't know him that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. And I did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified, this is the Son of God. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples, that was um, Andrew and John. And looking at Jesus, as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. When his ministry was over, he moved aside. He said, I must decrease and he must increase. And Jesus had a, a powerful itinerant ministry, went all through Galilee and Judea and Israel and turned the nation on its ear. But he was headed for the cross the whole time. Jesus was born crucified. If Mary could have seen the back of his neck with spiritual eyes, she would have seen written there, born crucified because the lamb was slain before the foundation of the world. He said, for this cause, I came into the world. And when Jesus got to the cross the, the night before, first of all, right before he dies, he has the triumphal entry. And the Holy Spirit gets on the crowd and they start screaming, Hosanna to the son of David, throwing their robes and, and coats in the way and palm branches. The children running through the temple singing, Hosanna to the son of David. As your king comes to you, meek and lowly, riding on a donkey, on the foal of a donkey. But he was coming to Jerusalem to die for the universe. 
Have you ever thought about every decision Jesus made, every word He said, everything He did had universal impact. It affected the whole universe. And I've heard, if I make you mad, forgive me. If I disagree with another preacher, forgive me. But there's a teaching where it wasn't really a test. He didn't really suffer. He couldn't have really uh, done anything. He was a robot. Folks, that's a lie hatched in the incubators of hell. He was a real man. He really died. And he really suffered. And it wasn't a robot or something that he had no option in. He could have messed up. I believe that with all my heart. I know that's going to make... I hope it doesn't, but people think, well, he couldn't have messed up, he couldn't have sinned. If he couldn't have, it wouldn't have been a test. It wouldn't have made any sense. The devil would have been in on it, playing a, a charade in front of everybody. When the devil tempted him in the wilderness, it, people teach that wasn't really a temptation. It was just a show. Folks, Jesus was a man. He came and lived in this world. He laid aside His omnipresence, His omniscience, uh, his, uh, uh, all of His attributes of power and glory. And He came down as a man and lived as one of us. But His nature was divine. And I don't believe He had a split personality like everyone preaches. He was Jesus, the Son of the living God. And He was holy God and holy man in His nature. There's one glory he couldn't hide. And that was his moral glory. His holiness. He couldn't hide that. That's what made everybody so mad. As he got to the cross, he went to Gethsemane. And I, I'm going to hurry along here. I could preach all day on this, literally. But he got to Gethsemane. Listen to me close, please. We all preach it wrong. Most of us. Not all, but most of us. Poor Jesus, when he sees how much he's going to suffer, he tries to get out of it. That's the opposite of what the Word teaches. The opposite. The opposite. The Bible says that he turned, he went to Gethsemane as his custom was. The book of Luke is one prayer meeting to the next prayer meeting. As his habit was. It's a good habit. He went to Gethsemane to pray with his disciples. And as they were entering Gethsemane, he turned to them and said, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death. He was starting to die right then. I believe my opinion is Satan was killing him. As the weight of the sins of the universe began to descend on him. And the Bible says for the only time in his life, he was amazed. He was amazed and troubled. And he started dying. I believe, and this is not just me, medical doctors teach this. And when they thrust the spear in, blood and water came out. A medical doctor, some Christian once said that that means the sack around his heart had ruptured. John said I, twice, I saw it with my own eyes. Blood and water came out of his side. The agony of Gethsemane was so great. And folks, the devil has ruined the picture of it. It's not a man running from the cross. It's the Son of God afraid he's not going to make it to the cross. He knew he was born to redeem mankind. He came to do the will of the Father. He was slain before the foundation of the world. And he realized he was dying. Right then he wasn't going to make it to the cross. And he thought he knew the will of his father, but all of a sudden, here's something happening that amazed even the Son of God. And he was troubled, and he was uh, very, very upset, the Greek says. And he said, please, for the first time in his life, he asked someone to help him in prayer. He asked, he went with the 12, uh, 11, and then he went a little further on with the 3, and he said, please pray with me one hour. Peter, James, and John, please pray with me. And they went to sleep. And Jesus went a little further, a stone's throw further, and knelt down and began to be in agony, the Bible says. He, when he prayed for the cup to pass from him, it wasn't the cross tomorrow. It was the cup of death he was drinking right then. Hebrews 5, 7, and 8 says, Who in the days of his flesh offered up prayers with strong crying and tears 
and was heard when he prayed and what he feared and was delivered from death. The only place Jesus would deliver from death was in Gethsemane, the, the olive press. And he was there and he was praying and the Bible says that he began to be in agony and he knelt down and he began to pray in agony. And the Bible says in Mark, it says that as he prayed, he began to hemorrhage blood through the sweat glands of his body, sweat pores of his body. And doctors say, you can't do that and live. The pressure and the agony was so great that he began to literally ooze blood out of his sweat pores. And Mark says that great clots of blood began to fall to the ground. Folks, that's a prayer meeting. And I'm so excited that Jesus Christ, He wasn't just what He did on the cross in Gethsemane alone. Alone, when He asked people to pray, He he had a prayer meeting and a battle and some spiritual warfare that we don't really preach or teach about. But He battled for you and I. Folks, you talk about surrender. The greatest surrender that's ever been made. He surrendered in eternity past. He thought he knew the will of God. But now it looks like God has changed his mind. And he said, Father, not my will, but thine be done. But just in case, just in case, it was still God's will. He said, Father, if it be possible, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. And as he was in agony and bleeding from head to toe, he went back to, to beg them to pray some more. And they, they didn't know what to say. Here's the Son of God covered in blood praying. And as he prayed three times in agony, the Bible says angels came and strengthened him. And I want you to know he made a surrender there that no one has ever had to, have to, had to make. He surrendered you and I up. He surrendered the world up. He surrendered his bride up. Most of all, he surrendered his bride. The Bible said he went to the cross and endured the shame uh, because of the joy that was set before him. His father had shown him what was going to happen. And I, I believe that the purpose purpose of all creation is to train and prepare a bride for the Son of God who has no companion, no like, until we get there. And He surrendered the bride up. The reason He came, the church, He surrendered the church up and He had to let it all go and just trust God and trust His Father. But just in case, let this cup pass from me. And I won't dwell anymore on that, but that's so... Deep and profound. The suffering of Gethsemane as he began to drink the wrath of God. The cup of the wrath of God. And angels strengthened him just enough to get to the cross. Dallas Holm wrote a beautiful song called He Died of a Broken Heart. And I believe that's true. Because they didn't have to break his leg so he couldn't breathe. He was dead. And i tell you something I always get excited about. The Romans didn't kill Jesus. The Jews didn't kill Jesus. He laid his life down. No one took it from him. He, he held it cheap, saints. The thing we have that's most precious to us, our very life, he held it cheap and let it go for us. He laid his life down when he did, when it was over. And I'll get to that in a minute quickly, but he did it himself. No one took his life from him. He gave it willingly. And then he, and you know something, the church wouldn't preach the cross and the blood anymore. So God raised up an actor in Hollywood, a Catholic actor in Hollywood to preach the cross. It's called the passion of the Christ. And in Muslim countries, I mean, I went to the first showing with Jim Caviezel, uh, a, pre, a preview with Jim Caviezel, the actor that played Jesus. And they got done. It wasn't finished editing yet. They didn't have music and sound. But when they got done, there was not a peep. It was deathly silent. And a young, it was packed. There must have been 5,000 people there. And in the back, a young man said, oh, Jesus, we did that to you. Then the altars flooded. A thousand people a week are getting saved in Iran, in Iraq, excuse me, right now. And some of them are watching the passion of the Christ on the internet. That's one thing they can't stop is satellites in the internet. And they're getting saved by seeing the gospel. And there's a group from France putting the, the gospel on computers in the Arabic. And a thousand people are weak. They just had a pastor's conference in uh, Jordan. And a thousand pastors from the Middle East, indigenous pastors were there. 
Because if you start preaching the cross and the blood, God will make a way. If you're preaching junk, He won't make a way. And Jesus, His phys- and that, that movie's amazing. I've studied the cross for decades and His physical suffering. And that movie amazingly had the details right. The scourging. The Bible says their back looked like raw hamburger meat. And you can see their lungs through their back when those professional Roman soldiers scourged them. And when they nailed him to the cross with those big spikes and they dug a three foot deep hole and dropped the cross just as another way of suffering, dropped it and when it hit the bottom and they would lunge against the spikes and tear their flesh. His physical suffering was awful. And I could go into all the things he said and they all were wonderful and beautiful. But I want to move ahead a little bit. As horrible as his physical suffering was, That was the least of his suffering. People have suffered physically. Tortured in China right now, maybe more than Jesus did physically. But no one suffered in their soul ever or ever will like he did. In that weakened, if I get a hangnail, I have a bad day. If I mash my finger, I got a bad week. Can you imagine in that pain, he was on fire. His hands, his feet were pierced. He had a crown of thorns. He he was literally on fire with pain. And in the midst of that horrible suffering, something even worse happened. The Bible says he became sin. All the sins that mankind had ever committed was committing right then and would ever commit were gathered up supernaturally by God himself and deposited into the bosom of his son. And he literally became sin. Every murder, every lie, every kidnapping was deposited into the bosom of the innocent, spotless, sinless Lamb of God. Our own sins kill us. Can you imagine all the sin? And from 12 noon, Jesus didn't die on a Friday. He died on a Wednesday. From 12 noon to 3 in the afternoon, the most awful, unmitigated suffering that's ever taken place in the universe took place in those three hours on Calvary. On a Wednesday afternoon, he didn't say one word. He had made some statements, but now it's just between him and God. And folks, he had his family there, his mom, friends. Those are wonderful. But it really comes down to just you and God. And his best friend the one that he leaned on the Father's bosom became his worst enemy because God cannot fellowship sin. And he turned his back. Jesus had told his disciples, I all, you will all forsake me and leave, but I always have my Father with me. And on the cross in the agony that he was going through, The father turned his back on him because he could not fellowship sin. And for the first and last time ever, it it never happened before that. It'll never happen again. But for the first and last time, God cut himself off from part of himself. And left part of himself hanging on an old cross, being treated like an animal. And and at the same time, all this is going on, Jesus... uh, You know, one thing amazing to me, the Bible says Samson didn't know the Spirit of the Lord had left him. But Jesus immediately knew the Father's presence had withdrawn in that agony, in that pain. Most of us don't sense it for years. But he knew immediately that the Father's presence had withdrawn. And he said, my God, Eli, Eli. And folks, it's the only time in the Bible where someone said one sentence in two languages. His suffering was so great, he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, in Hebrew. And he switched to his native tongue of Aramaic. Lama said back to me, why have you left me? And he didn't say another word for three hours. 
And in that three hours, he endured all the wrath of a holy, offended, omnipotent God. All seven vials of the wrath of God. The perfect wrath of God that are going to be poured out on this world during the tribulation period. It's so awful that when the wrath of God, those vials are poured out, the Bible says the whole world is going to stagger to and fro like a drunken man. That was all deposited in the bosom of the Son of God. And it coursed through his veins and his soul. The Bible said he endured the wrath of God. You know what's good about that? I'll never know one drop of God's wrath. I'll never experience one iota, not one speck of God's wrath because my Savior, Jesus, the Son of the living God, absorbed it all for me on the cross and I only know the love of God and the power of God. Because Jesus climbed up on that cross and took my place. He took your place. And he, he dealt with our sins. And He endured the wrath of God for me. And now the Bible says we've been delivered from the wrath to come. By the way, that's the only message that ever brought revival to the church in the past. The wrath of God. I could go on there a lot. So much happened to the cross. I don't believe we'll know for all eternity. Isaiah 52 says his suffering was so great that he didn't look like a human being anymore. When they looked at the cross, there was something hanging there that didn't even look human. His face was more marred than any man. Some blackened, accursed creature in agony hanging there on the cross. And Isaiah said, well, he had no beauty that we should desire him. And I could go on, but I want to hurry up. And now, the Bible says, Jesus, knowing that all things have been accomplished. Everything, that Greek word means the last I had been dotted. The last period had been put. Knowing that all things had been accomplished. He wants to say something. He had refused to drink earlier because it deadened the pain. And he said, I thirst and there's so many prophecies and psalms. I mean, you need to look them all up about what happened. Hundreds of things were fulfilled there. And they gave him a drink. And he pulls himself up because you had to, to talk. Because that was the point. You couldn't breathe. And in his agony, knowing all things had been accomplished, cried with a loud voice. Te Telestai. It's over. It's settled. It's finished. It's done. And I'll tell you, those are the best words probably in the Bible. And he, I believe he was saying, I want hell to know. I want mankind to know. I want all the fallen angels to know. I want the good angels to know. But most of all, Father, I want you to know it's over. It's settled. It's finished. It's done. And folks, 2,000 plus years later, it's still over. It's still finished. It's still done. He did it once and for all. The mighty redeeming work of the Son of God took care of every problem you'll ever have. Your sins, uh, the wrath of God, everything you would ever... And I'll tell you another doctrine that was hatched in the incubators of hell that Jesus went to hell while he was in the tomb he did not go to hell he put out the fire of hell on the cross he put out the fire of hell on the cross for you and I and I'm a little excited about that I don't have to go to hell I'll never see hell I'll never face that worm that won't die and see that fire that can't be quenched because Jesus killed that worm on the cross and he put the fire of hell out for his people and now we only know a loving 
powerful, almighty Jehovah Yahweh God who can do anything and flung the stars in space. That was a cry of victory. And then he said, Father, he bowed his head. He said, Father, into your hands I deposit my spirit. And he died. He gave up his spirit. And they put him in the tomb. He's still with me. I'm almost done. I can't, can't leave him there. For three days and three nights, not Friday night and Saturday. For three days and three nights, he was in the grave. A lot of things happened during then. And I tell you, I don't understand why the church keeps the best music for just two days a year. Christmas music and Easter music. Well, let's don't celebrate the resurrection any other time. Let's just wait. And when I was growing up in church, I, w I, I took piano lessons from the same lady that taught Marilyn Monroe. We were both really good on the piano. I'm just kidding. And she used to play every Easter on the piano. She's a wonderful pianist. Lo, in the grave he lay. Jesus, my Savior. Waiting the coming day. Jesus, my Lord. And all the pictures are wrong. They show him standing in the door of the tomb. That's not scriptural at all. The Bible said when they rolled the stone away, it was empty. He wasn't there. Uh, the angel said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. He's already gone into Galilee before you. And then he came and, and appeared to Mary and different ones. But uh, the chorus of the song goes like this. Up from the grave he arose. With a mighty triumph over his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain. And he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose. He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. And in heaven, that's what they're singing day and night. And I want to tell you something. In Revelation chapter 1, Jesus said, I am he that was alive. I am he that is alive. I was dead, but now I'm alive. In the Greek, it means I got to be dead. That's not like me. I don't usually go around dying. I'm never going to die again. And folks, when you got saved, you got life that's been through death and come up victorious out of death and can't be killed. I am he that got to be dead, but now I am alive forevermore. When uh, Elizabeth Tudor, I believe was the name, was sworn in as Queen of England, coronated the first time on television. Part of it in black and white, part of it in color. You can watch some of it on YouTube. It's not all there, but some of it's there. And she was coronated, and it was a big deal. Believe me, it was, man, it was huge. She was pronounced queen and coronated. And at the very end of the ceremony, the first knight of Great Britain rides out on a giant white Arabian stallion and turns sideways on, in front of the throne in full battle armor. He pulls up his visor, takes off his right gauntlet, throws it on the ground in front of the throne. And he said, anyone who would deny the right of Elizabeth Tudor to sit on the throne of Great Britain and rule and reign, let him come forth right now and do me battle. No one came out. But I can see Jesus getting back to heaven. The Bible said he led captivity captive. He made a show of them openly. He made a parade of his captives. And when he got back to heaven, uh, uh, and when he got up there, he said, open up the everlasting gates, open up the everlasting doors. Uh, and they said, who, who, and let the king of glory come in. He said, who is the king of glory? And he said, the Lord God mighty in battle. The Lord of hosts is his name. Uh, the commander in chief of heaven's armies is here right now. Open up the everlasting gates, open up the everlasting doors. And, and when he got back, I can see the Father throwing the gauntlet down in front of hell, in front of Satan, and said, anyone who would deny the right of my son to rule and reign over this universe for all eternity, let him step forth right now and do me battle. Not one peep out of hell. Not one peep from the angels. Not one peep from mankind. And for now, from all eternity, Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and He is victorious. And the power of the cross is still alive. The victory of the cross is present and available to all of us. In Revelation, this angel showed John a beautiful scroll with seven beautiful seals. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit. But the angel said, you want to see this? 
Yes, he really wanted to see it. It was beautiful. The angel said, too bad. They searched heaven. They searched earth. And they searched under the earth to find anyone worthy to take the scroll and loose the seals thereof. They couldn't find anyone. And John sat down and wept. The Bible says he wept much. He really started crying because he really wanted to see what was in that scroll. And the angel said, Weep not for the lion out of the tribe of Judah. He hath prevailed to open the scroll and loose the seals thereof. And John said, While I watched, I looked over at the throne and expecting to see a giant lion. He said, I looked over next to the throne and I saw a little, baby, little tiny baby lambkin with its throat cut. And the blood, the Greek word means the blood still spurting out of his throat. The marks of slaughter on him. And that little tiny lamb got up and walked over to the throne of God and loosed the seal and loosed the seals on that scroll. Took it out of God's right hand. Loosed the seals on it. And the Bible said all the host of heaven, all the host redeemed thousands of thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. The four and 20 elders, the four living creatures, they all fell on their face and screamed at the top of their voice till it sounded like Niagara Falls. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive honor. That's what they're singing right now. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive honor and power and glory and dominion and riches and might and strength for by thy blood thou hast redeemed us from every tribe, every tongue, every nation. And someday, folks, uh, Genghis Khan, Napoleon Bonaparte, Obama, uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, Madoff, Hitler, Ronald Reagan, you and I, every demon, Satan himself, they're going to bow their knee. They don't want to do it, uh, but God going to make them do it and confess the truth. Not just God, but that man Jesus is Lord. And they're going to scream out in the Greek, Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Stand with me. Come on, give Him a shout of praise. Lord, we praise You. Thank You for the cross. Thank You for Your precious blood. Thank You for Your blood, Lord. Thank You for Your awful suffering. Lord, let us go out of this place with a new revelation of the price that you paid. When you said we've been bought with a price, that means something. What an all, we're, it's free, but it's not cheap. It costs you everything. And let us go witness to the lost and dying world about the Lamb of God and how he suffered on the cross. Don't let us just say he paid the fine or he died for you. But let us say the Lamb of God became sin for you. He endured the wrath of God for you. I'm going to turn this back over to whoever. But first, I want you to just thank Him. Come on. Just thank Him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for not quitting halfway. Thank you for fighting in Gethsemane for us. Thank you for battling the hosts and powers of darkness in Gethsemane and keeping your will laid down there. And that awful suffering, that awful surrender, and you made it to the cross, and you paid for our sins an awful price. Lord, every day let us remember your suffering. When we take communion, let us remember your suffering. Lord, but now you're also victorious. You're alive and living inside of us. A living Savior. You don't die anymore. You're alive forevermore with resurrection, life, and power. And you're the head of the church. Come and fill us with that lamb nature. We want to be your bride. We want to grow up and be like you, Jesus. In your mighty name. Saints, behold the lamb of God in his travail. And behold the lamb of God in his triumph. He defeated all the powers of hell for you and your family. Don't leave them behind. Take your family with you. Moses said, I will not leave one hoof behind to Pharaoh, not one hair of their heads. Let's have that same commitment. Let's get them all into heaven. God bless you. I think that God his son not sparing he bled and died to take away my sin then sings my soul my Savior God to thee I pray the Lord I pray the Lord then sings my soul Thank you.
at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away it was there by faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the day but drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my son, and now I am happy. He all the day it was there by faith I receive my sight and now I am happy all the day tears and deep emotional gratitude or plows that break the heart and bring brokenness but it better bring us to this therefore since Christ suffered for us in the flesh arm yourself with this attitude 
For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. If an appreciation for the cross of Christ does not lead to the fact that you arm yourself, that you will cease from sin. You can cry and weep before the throne of God a million years without understanding it. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And these, in regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them into the same flood of dis dissipation and they speak evil of you. Well, they will have to give an account. And so will anyone else who goes on sinning willfully, trampling the blood of the Son of God under their feet, claiming it's their right and passageway into heaven. We'll have a prayer. I want to share something quickly. Years ago, I said, Lord, what's so powerful about the gospel? You died on the cross. You were buried. You rose again from the dead. But what's so powerful about it to me? And God began to show that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not only the only message of deliverance. It is the only method of deliverance. If you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Amen. And so by claiming the Holy Spirit's effectual moment by moment application of the work of the cross in our heart and life, self dethroned, Christ enthroned, we live in victory over sin. He doesn't give us life with you when we overcome. He gives us overcoming life. And then we overcome. Amen. Isn't it wonderful how God has just brought all this together? Thank you, brother. Thank you for bringing us to the cross in a fresh way. Amen. Praise the Lord. I tell you, getting back to the cross, the living Christ, let's have prayer. Father, we bless your name. Was it for crimes that I had done? He groaned upon a tree amazing, pity, grace enough, and love beyond degree. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, the burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight. And now I'm joyful. And Jesus, because you rose again from the dead, he that spread not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Lord, bless my brother's continued ministry. Bless him with those students who have a passion for Jesus. And not just a passion for Jesus, but a compassion for the world. Raise up more songs of worship and adoration and praise out of Christ for the nations. God, last night my heart was so burdened for our Christian college campuses. Father, I've never seen the old people. In history where there's re great revival, typically, it's with young people. You use older people. And, but, oh, God, it's often with the young people. And we ask you tonight in Jesus' name today for the mighty moving of your Holy Spirit upon our Christian college campuses. Oh, God. Pour out your spirit on our campuses.
Give him a boldness. Raise up preachers, worshipers, evangelists, preachers, teachers. Raise up servants, oh God, on our Christian campuses. Set the campuses ablaze. And let that fire spread. And we give you all the glory and all the honor. That Lord, that obedient life is the description of a true believer. The life of Christ described, lived out, fleshed out. Bless the food, Lord. We thank you for it. We thank you for meeting with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Jesus, who is alive and on the throne. <laughs> the cross is bare, the tomb is empty, and the throne is occupied. <laughs> Lord, you haven't waned in your strength. Your eyes have not grown dim. <laughs> You're almighty God. And we worship and praise your name this day. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.